Come on, can we give the Lord praise this morning? To worship you, I live. What about you? To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to tell you something. You don't have to leave here bound today. You don't have to leave here in sin anymore. I'm telling you, you can be free. Amen. You can be a changed man or a changed woman today. You'll just turn your life over to Jesus Christ. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Right now, you can give your heart to God. Amen. And I'll tell you what, it'll be the greatest day of your life. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. What an honor and what a privilege it is to see you. We've already had one service this morning, had a great service. Just the presence of God was here. That crowd was a little bit sleepy, but they were here. And uh, so I'm glad you're here for the second service today. And we've been up since early this morning getting ready for this. I want to give a shout out to all of our staff in both services uh, that make it possible. Amen. We will have a third service this afternoon, but I'm going to be eating lunch during that one. Amen. That is our Hispanic church. They will be here this afternoon and uh, just praying that they have a great time on Easter Sunday too. It's just so good to see some faces that I haven't seen in a while. And thank you for being here. Good to have you. Do what, honey? Make it, please. Thank you so much for everyone who helped to spruce up the place, help decorate. And everyone who purchased lilies uh, for Easter Sunday to help decorate, please uh, do not take your lily until you see Miss Janet. Will you be up front following the service? You have several people on each end. You'll have somebody on each end. So if you purchased a lily, don't take one if you didn't purchase one, but if you purchased a lily, then there will be someone on each end. Just give them your name and the, how many you purchased. They'll mark your name off. Thank you so much for doing that. Also to Pastor Justin and Pastor Angel, thank you so much for the beautiful crosses. Thank you. If you take a lily and you didn't buy it, there's trackers in them. I just want to let you know that. So we are going to find you and hunt you down, and we're going to get that lily back. Amen? Amen. Uh, many uh, people bought those, and most of them in memory of their loved ones, so we want them to have them if, we want the, if they want them. And uh, don't, uh, don't look around and go, well, there's plenty left. I'm going to take me one. Well, there was people in the first service that we told them they couldn't have theirs yet. So uh, anyway, help us with that. We'll try to get them Wednesday night. I know you wouldn't do that. I'm just picking with you this morning. Amen. I, I love you. It's so good to have you today. I've already preached once this morning. I'm still looking forward to preaching again uh, this morning the Word of God. How many of you got dinner in the oven? Boy, does anybody cook anymore? Amen. Wow, uh, I, th I think I saw two hands out of this whole crowd. We have dinner ready. Sister Hunt has dinner ready, and I'm looking forward uh, to that. And I guess the rest of you are going out and eat or at sandwiches. I don't know what's happening with you folks, but uh, amen. The day of the cook is gone. Amen. But uh, we'll, uh, we're going to get you to your meal after this, but we're going to have church and the Word first. How about that? I'll share the Word of God with you today. Now, to some of my staff that was in the first service, uh, if I were to ask you all five points of my sermon without you out you looking at your wrist, some of you couldn't tell me. So don't think, oh, I'm just going to tune you out now. Just go ahead and listen so you can really get it down uh, this morning. I want to share a, a, a story with you. It says, one Easter morning, a woman was on her way to church when her car broke down. Not wanting to be late for the special service, she ordered an Uber to pick her up. The car arrived, and she quickly jumped in the back. Halfway through the ride, she asked the driver a question, but the driver didn't respond. So she leaned forward and tapped the driver on the arm. The driver let out a loud scream, swerved into the other lane, almost hit another car, slammed on the brakes, and skidded over to the shoulder. The woman and the driver just sat in silence for a moment, for a moment from the shock of what just happened. Finally, she said apologetically, wow, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that tapping your, your shoulder 
would, would alarm you in such a way. And he said to her, no, you really didn't do anything wrong. It's just this is my first day driving an Uber. He said, you see, for the past 25 years, I've been driving a funeral hearse. I thought that's a good story for today because we know somebody got up from the grave. Come on now. We know somebody got up from the grave. I, uh, that's kind of funny, but sometimes I ride with the funeral drivers in the hearse. So but that doesn't bother me. Uh, but, uh, man, what a story, huh? It made me think twice next time. This scripture is not going to be on the screen because I added it later, but I want to read you a scripture, and you're welcome to turn there in John 21. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. John chapter 21. Verse 25, let's read it. And there also are many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Wow. Think about that. Jesus did so much that... If the books could be written, the books could not contain all that he did. Now, I said this in the first service, but uh, you might say, well, there couldn't be but so many stories. Surely the, the books would contain, but Jesus is still doing it. Jesus is still rewriting stories in our lives. He's still doing things in this day and hour that we live in. And for 2,000 years, Amen. The Lord has been doing great things that all the books in the world could not contain everything that he had done. Can somebody say praise the Lord? I want to preach to you today a sermon entitled, What a Story. What a Story. You know, everybody loves a great story, whether that be a, a story from a book that you have read or a storyline from a movie. Uh, that you have watched. We love a story that catches our attention and a story that touches our emotions. And I had wrote down, and there's many more, but I wrote down a few stories that I had read in my lifetime. And these stories here I actually read as a, it would have been as a teenager when I was in high school. But I thought of three great stories that I had read. One of them is the story of Helen Keller. Does anybody, does that ring a bell with you? who Helen Keller was. I want to admonish you, younger generation, go back and find out who this lady was. But let me just give you a brief synopsis. Helen Keller is one of the most memorable women in history. Despite being blind as well as deaf, did you hear that? Blind and deaf. She learned to communicate and lived a life devoted to helping others. By her faith, her determination, and her spirit, she helped, it helped her to accomplish far more than people ever expected. I want to tell you, Helen Keller became a very successful business person, very successful in all that she did in life, and she was not just blind, but she was also deaf and had to learn how to communicate in life. What a great woman. I remember also the story of a woman by the name of Anne Frank. Does that ring a bell? I know I'm talking way back, but like so many other Jews, Anne did not survive the Holocaust, but her diary did. With over 30 million copies sold and translated into 70 different languages, Anne Frank's diary is regarded by scholars as an incredible first-hand account of what life was like for a Jewish girl during the German occupation during World War II. Great stories if you've never read them. And then the stories of Corey Ten Boom, another woman. Corey Ten Boom was a Dutch watchmaker who, along with her family, harbored hundreds of Jews amid the Nazi Holocaust to protect them from arrest during World War II and dying. Listen to this. It is believed their efforts nearly saved 800 Jewish lives. Eventually betrayed by a fellow Dutch citizen, the entire family 
was imprisoned. I challenge you to read the stories on all three of these lives. These are amazing women. Now, I know you're thinking today, are we going to talk about any amazing men? We will in just a moment, okay? But those are three stories that stuck with me. I was a, I was a World War II buff when I was in high school. I loved World War II. I want to tell you, my final exam, amen, this may be the only exam I ever passed that way, but my final exam in history, World War II had 100 questions. Anybody want to guess what pastor made? Don't be ugly. I made 105 because there was a bonus question on there. That was just what I loved. Now, don't ask me about algebra. Don't ask me about trigonometry. Don't ask me about any of that. Thank God I didn't have to use it as a preacher. Amen? I had to find a calling that I didn't have to use any of that. But I got you on history, I guarantee you. So those were three great women. And there were a lot of great people throughout history. However, there is no greater story on earth than the story of Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad I get to preach about that story this morning. You are wearing the story on your wrist today. You received the, the band as you came in. If you placed it on your wrist, you're wearing it on your wrist today. And what that is going to do today, it is going to help you keep up with where I'm at in my sermon this morning. Are you looking around that band? That, band, that sermon goes all the way around that band. Yes, it does. Amen. And I'm going to go all the way around that band with you this morning. So you are wearing the story on your wrist today. Listen, the entire Bible, say that with me, entire Bible points to Jesus Christ. The entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. I just wanted you to repeat the one part with me, not my whole sermon, so stop, okay? I didn't give you a cutoff point, did I? Did you know that the Bible is the number one selling book in the world? By a long shot. Nothing else is even close. Thank God for that. Although when we study the Bible, we see that Jesus is more visible in the New Testament, the Old Testament is also ultimately about Him as well. So today I want to share with you five chapters in the story of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Five chapters. Number one. Chapter number one, He came. God in His infinite love to us had a plan. Praise the Lord. Wave your hand this morning for the plan that God had. Thank you, Lord. God had a plan, a plan to provide a Savior to the world. The world needed a Savior. Humanity was lost, and humanity needed deliverance of their sins. We need deliverance of our sins. So chapter 1 of the life of Jesus is simply about a coming Messiah. Messiah meaning the promised anointed one, the Christ, the Savior. It's about the coming Messiah to a very lost world. If you want to summarize the plan of God, all you have to do is turn to John 3.16. We know that, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So Jesus came that you and I might have eternal life. The awaited Messiah came, but not as everyone thought. You see, the Jews were looking for an earthly king, but God sent a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, a baby born of a virgin. He was no earthly king, but he was a heavenly king. He was the king of kings. And the Lord of lords, he was God's very own son. So the Old Testament prophesied of his coming. And the New Testament saw his coming fulfilled. So listen to this. Chapter 1 is what we celebrate at Christmas. The birth of a Savior. And without chapter 1, then chapter 2 could have never been possible. What is chapter 2? Chapter 2 is entitled, He Died. He came and there was a reason for the coming of Jesus 
to this earth. What was it, Pastor? He was coming to die. That was it. He was coming to die, not for anything he had done. The Bible said he walked this earth perfect without sin. That's what the Word of God says. He came to die for the sins of humanity. He came to die for your sins, and he came to die for my sins. The Bible says he would come as a lamb being led to the slaughter. Listen, crucifixion by death was for murders and thieves, not Jesus Christ. But for a Jewish man named Jesus who claimed to be a Messiah, it was the ultimate sacrifice, what he did for you and I. What was he doing? He was shedding his blood for our sins, for what we did, for what we had decided to do within our own will and our own nature. He died for our sins. I don't know what that means to you today, but it means everything to me, that he died for my sins. If you look at Old Testament prophecy and New Testament fulfillment, and you compare them, let's do that just a little bit. When the Roman soldiers took Jesus before Pilate, the disciples, the Bible says, had already abandoned Jesus. In fact, Zechariah 13, 7, the scripture says, Jesus quoted, God will strike the shepherd and his sheep will scatter. Let me tell you something. There is a direct link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. All in the Old Testament, you're going to see the prediction of the coming of a Savior, of the death of the Savior, of a resurrection of a Savior. Come on now. You're going to see it all through the Scripture. In fact, in Psalm 22, 16, it states, My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs, and evil gangs, clo uh, evil gangs closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. That's in the Old Testament. That's 900 years before crucifixion had even been invented. It was prophesied in the Word of God. Jesus was beaten with a lead-tipped whip that ripped his flesh from his back. Isaiah 56, verse 6 says, I offered my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. They beat Jesus on his back. And they beat him, or, and they plucked out his beard. Listen to that. And the Bible also says, and he, it says in Old Testament, I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting. It says in Psalm 69, 21, Old Testament, my life is poured out on me like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the root of my mouth. That's Psalm 69, 21. And in the scripture, it says, they offer me sour wine for my thirst. You know what happened at the cross? The soldiers offered Jesus wine mixed with gall rather than water for his thirst. Listen, what it, the Old Testament, I'm trying to draw this to you this morning, and the New Testament are linked together when it comes to Jesus coming to this earth. The Bible is about Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Do you know that Jesus could have come down from the cross at any time? The Bible said he could have called uh, many angels at his disposal, but instead he hung on the cross and he said these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Further proof is in Psalm twenty-two, eighteen, 18, Old Testament Scripture, they divided my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. And we know that at the foot of the cross, they gambled or they threw dice for Jesus' uh, clothes that he had on. In fact, they thought that they might would be playing a game uh, with Jesus' clothes called king for a day. Listen to me. He was more than king for a day. He's king for eternity. He's always been king and he always will be king. The Bible tells us that Jesus was crucified between two thieves. First, it tells us in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 53, 12, it says, He was counted among rebels. He bore the sins of many and intercedes for rebels. Think about that. Old Testament, New Testament, about Jesus. The Bible tells us at the scene of the cross also, darkness covered uh, the area when Jesus died. In Amos 9, Amos is in the Old Testament. In that day, says the Sovereign Lord, 
I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth while it is still day. You know, they say, the historians say that the darkness that covered the area reached to Greece and lasted from noon until 3 o'clock. Old Testament, New Testament. In Psalm 20, 20, 21, the scripture says, My God, Jesus is talking here, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Bible says the Roman soldiers would usually break the legs of the person being crucified. But when they came to Jesus to do so, he was already dead. You know what Psalm 3420 says? For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. So after Jesus had hung there and he had died for our sins, then he was taken down from the cross and his body was taken and prepared and laid in a borrowed tomb, in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph was a, a secret follower of Jesus, and he gave him his tomb. Do you know what it says in Isaiah 53, 9? And let me say this before I read the scripture. Joseph was a rich man. You know what it says in Isaiah 53, 9? He, talking about Jesus, was put in a rich man's grave. Come on now, the Old Testament, amen, and the New Testament. You know, there's a group of people out there that will tell you the Old Testament don't matter. Listen. You don't read the Old Testament, you only read half the story. Because it's all about Jesus Christ. He died on a Friday for the sins of the world. He died for you and me. In his own words, he said, it is finished. And it sure looked like it was. And they buried him in a borrowed tomb. His disciples thought this is where the story ends. They had dispersed. They had gone back to fishing. They had gone back to their things that they had did in that previous life before they followed the Lord. They had gone home. They were very sad. They were very sorrowful. They thought it was over. The end. The end of the story. Book finish. Only two chapters. He came and he died. But did you forget who the author was? The author's ways are not our ways. God, the Father, was the author. God had a plan. It wasn't a, a poorly thought out plan, but a perfect plan. And because of God, and because of his perfect plan, there would be a chapter 3. I can't get 3 up. I had 2 up. I couldn't get my third one up. Amen. Chapter 3, he arose. By the way, just to give you hope, chapter 2 is the longest chapter I have. Chapter 3, he arose. No one was expecting that or even looking for it. But day 3 was coming. It was Sunday, early in the morning on the first day of the week. When they arrived, the stone had been rolled away by someone. The tomb was found empty, and his body was gone. The angel said to them, He's not here. He is risen. Yes, Jesus had risen on the third day just as he said. Just as it was prophesied in the Old Testament and Jesus had spoken the New Testament, He rose from the grave. He had conquered death. You might ask, Pastor, what's so significant about that? You need to know that because you're here today celebrating Resurrection Sunday. You need to know why. What's so significant about a risen Savior? How about this? Because He lives, we also can live. Because He lives, we can have eternal life. And by His death and resurrection, sin is conquered. The keys of death, hell, and the grave have been taken from the devil forever. He's not going to ever get them back again. His resurrection provided to all of us hope. And we are able to celebrate today because Jesus rose from the dead. Can somebody say, praise the Lord. 
Amen. So he rose in resurrection power. He got up from the grave, folded the linen napkin that was about his head, and he walked out of the borrowed tomb. He borrowed it because he only needed it three days. Now, because he arose, there is a chapter 4. Chapter 4, he appeared to them of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. When Jesus arose to his ascension was 40 days. And there had been many people that had interactions with Christ during that time. He He appeared to Mary at the garden tomb. She initially mistook him for the gardener, but soon recognized who he was. He appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to a doubting Thomas, come on now, that doubted. He appeared, he re, he appeared and redeemed and reinstated Peter, who had denied Christ, who said he would never deny Christ. But the Lord said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. That's what happened. And he left very sad. But he redeemed him. And he reinstated him. Can I just stop and say to you today, God still redeems us. He still reinstates us. Listen, if you've messed up and you're away from God today and you're not where you need to be in your life today, just repent. Just repent of your sins and ask the Lord to be the Lord of your life again. And I want to tell you, He will do that. He did it for Peter. He'll do it for you. It was there that He gave the Great Commission right before His ascension. The Great Commission that said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. He said, And surely I am with you always, even till the end of the age. And the Bible says, And then he ascended. If you look in Acts chapter 1, verse number 9, it says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And that's where Jesus has been for a little over 2,000 years. Where has he been? He's been at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Come on now. He is our great high priest that we can go to, that we can march into the throne room of grace with our request. Jesus is there for us. But the story has one more chapter. And it's a good chapter. All of them have been good, but it's a good chapter. Chapter number 5 is entitled, He's Coming Back. Woo! He's Coming Back. On your bracelet are these five points. You're looking at the Bible on your bracelet this morning. He's coming back for His bride, the church. That's what the angel said when he said, this same Jesus that you have seen go up in the clouds is going to come back in the same manner. Church, I want to tell you, Jesus is coming again soon. Hallelujah. He's coming again soon. It is the blessed hope of the church, and we need to be ready for his coming. In Matthew 25, Uh, Verse 1 through 13, Jesus tells a story of ten virgins in a bridal party. And this, this parable, this story is about being ready for the return of the Lord. The Bible says five were wise and came adequately prepared with their lamps and an extra supply of oil. Listen, we need to stay prepared. We need to stay ready because He comes. He's coming. The other five were foolish, the Bible said, and did not come 
with additional oil. And while the foolish ones went to purchase more oil, the bridegroom arrived. He's coming at a moment we don't know. He's coming. The rapture of the church is going to take place. The Bible tells us while the foolish ones went to purchase more oil, he arrived. And only the five prepared virgins entered into the wedding banquet. And then that door was closed. Let me help you out for just a moment. The bridegroom in this story is Jesus Christ. And the parable refers to his return for his bride, the church. We are the church. The truth, fact, and absolute reality is that Jesus is definitely coming back. Say he's coming back. He's coming back. It doesn't matter if a person believes it or not. He's coming back. It's imminent. In Matthew 24, verse 36 and verse 44, listen to the words. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Therefore, you, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect him. I believe we're in that hour. I believe all the signs of the time are pointing to the end, are pointing to the tribulation. But prior to that tribulation, Jesus is going to return for his church. There's going to be a wedding in heaven, and we need to be ready for that time. And I've got a question for you. Are you ready? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? He's coming back. If you were to take a 30,000 foot view of the Bible today and you would take a look at it, it would look something like this. The Old Testament is anticipation of a coming Messiah. The Gospels are the manifestation of the Messiah coming. The book of Acts is proclamation about that Messiah. The epistles are explanation of that Messiah. And the book of Revelation is the consummation, hallelujah, of the Messiah, of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will finally reign, amen, on this earth and forever, amen, in the book of Revelation. So from beginning to end, your Bible is an epic story about Jesus Christ. Oh, I know there are other characters in the Bible. There are people that God used, people that God worked through. But there is a thread that runs from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation to the very end that hollers Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I can't think of any better reason than to be here today than to worship Jesus Christ, than to worship a risen Savior. Ken said it very well. Muhammad's dead. Can't worship him, shouldn't be anyway. Come on now. Buddha's dead. Can't worship him, we shouldn't be anyway. And other person after other person, other people that claim to be great people, leaders of uh, religious cults. Listen, they're dead. There's one religion, one faith. I'd rather say faith than religion. There's one faith where the leader got up out of a grave and rose from the dead. There's just one. Where the leader came and died for the sins of mankind. Just one. It's Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's Jesus Christ. What a story. What a story. I don't know when my first Bible was given to me, but it was the best 
book I ever received. The greatest book I ever received. Come on, if Moby Dick is your favorite book, you got problems. You need Jesus. Come on, if it's some other book that you've had, you may have enjoyed it, but I'll tell you what, you need the book. You need the Bible. Because it's a story about Jesus, and there's only one that can free you from your sins. There's only one that can set you free from everything that has you bound. And that is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. What a story. What a love for humanity. What a love for you and me. I want you to bow your heads. Prayer partners, would you come to the front? I'm so glad he has risen. And because he lives, I too can live. And I do live. Because he lives, I am not going to live this life without hope. I have all hope that one day I'm going to be with him and I'm going to join him in heaven. How do you know that, preacher? Because I've committed my life to Christ. Oh, friend, let me tell you, there's just one way. I want to tell you this first off. You don't get to heaven by just being good. You know, there's a lot of good people that aren't saved. There's a lot of good people that aren't saved and serve God and are obedient to God. They're good people. I know them. I know a lot of them. But there's only one way to heaven, just one. And it's through Jesus Christ. The Bible says he's the door, the door to the Father. And if you're here today and you don't know him, you need to know him. If you're here this morning and your life is not right with the Lord, you can get it right today. It can all start over for you on Easter 2024. You can commit your life to Christ, and I hope you'll do that. I believe the Holy Spirit has been moving in this service this morning, and here's what I know about the Holy Spirit. He's the one that actually draws men or compels men to come to Jesus. There's not a one of us that would be saved right now if He hadn't dealt with us and drawn us to the Lord and so I know that there that he's been at work this morning in these pews he's been dealing with some hearts and you've had a thought come to your mind that said you know what I need to get my life right with God I need to commit my heart to him and turn my life over to him and some of you may say I don't really even know how to do that well let me help you this morning today all you need to do is first off believe in your heart that God sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins, to shed His blood, that your sins might be forgiven. All you have to do is believe that on the third day He did rise again, and that you can have eternal life because of that. So you have to believe. The second thing you have to do is confess your sins. Confess your sins. God, I repent of my... That's not saying I'm sorry for my sins. We say we're sorry sometimes when we get caught. This is repenting. Repenting means making a 180 and never doing it again. So we must repent of our sins, and then finally we must ask Jesus to come live in our heart. If you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor? I hear you're preaching. I need Jesus. I need to make sure my heart is right with God. Every head is bowed. No one is looking around. If you want to get your heart right with God, would you just on the count of three today, when I count to three, raise your hand and then put it right back down when I count to three. Well, I'm going to lead you in the sinner's prayer today. Ready? One, two, three. Raise your hand right now. Thank you. Hands all over this place today. Thank you for listening to the Word of God this morning. 
let me lead you in the sinner's prayer. And when you pray this, I want you to believe it in your own heart. I want you to really be sincere about this prayer that you're praying. Let's do it. Let's go. Dear God, I need you today. I don't want to live how I've been living. I don't want to live this way any longer. I need you as my Lord and Savior. Lord, I believe today that you are my God and that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins and my sins can be forgiven. So, Lord, I ask you today, forgive me of all of my sins. Cast them as far as the east is from the west into the sea of forgetfulness, never to bring them up against me again. Father, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come live in my heart and be the Lord of my life. Lord, it's this day that I'm ready to make a change, that I'm ready to turn it around, that I'm ready to serve you and that I'm ready to live for you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord a thunderous ovation clap this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. Stand with me. We're going to sing a chorus. And while they're singing, if you have a need in your life, if you need prayer for anything, our prayer partners are down front. We want you to come and just stay with us a minute. Let's sing this chorus together. Let's praise Him. say to those of you who are here today, thank you so much. If this is your first time, we say welcome. Perhaps you came because you received a card, or perhaps you came because um, you are just came as an invitation to someone who does attend here. 
And however, whatever the reason may be, and you may be viewing online, we say thank you for coming. We're blessed that you're here with us today. We hope that you have a wonderful Easter from our family to your family. Um, make note that there is a photo screen out there. So if you want to take time with your family, as Pastor said in our morning service, um, next year you are going to be a year older, so you may want to have a remembrance of this year. So God bless you, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Also, if you have children next door, please do not forget your children uh, and uh, the nursery and the children's church. Amen. Let me say one more thing this morning. A lot of people raise their hand for salvation today. Listen, you can't give your heart to Christ and not serve the Lord. You've got to serve Him. There are some things involved in that. You need to find a church and get in a church. I just happen to know where one's at if you want to talk to me. Amen. But whatever, get in a good Bible-believing church somewhere and go there. You need to be around the body of believers, the saints of God to help keep you strong in the Lord. You need to be in His Word. You need to be on your knees. You need to be discipled. So you can't do that out there on your own, okay? Get in God's house and begin to serve Him. I look at Easter as a time of fresh starts. Resurrection Sunday, fresh starts. You got a fresh start today. Let's kick it into high gear and get going and serve God. Amen. We love you to you and your families. Have a blessed Resurrection Sunday. We appreciate you so much.